You guys saw what happened? You see what happened, how it now turned against them, backfired against them? If Jesus is a creature and he know, he's not God, why is a creature in heaven doing the things that God does from heaven? Okay, so let's now turn Philippians against them. Now, before I turn Philippians against them, let me show you what the Bible says about angelic creatures. Spirit creatures created to be messengers and servants of God. What are they by their nature? Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Jehovah Witness Bible, by the way. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I'm enjoying being used by the Spirit to teach you. Jeremy, I know you keep trying to play the devil's advocate. How many times do I need to respond to that stupid argument, even when you bring it up, Jeremy? Why does God need an agent in heaven? Can you stop bringing up that argument that I've already responded to when you played their role in previous sessions? Okay, Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Well, I, John, was the one hearing and seeing these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing me these things. But he tells me, be careful. Do not do that. I am only a fellow slave. So an angelic creature says, John, I'm a slave like you. A fellow slave, meaning you and I are slaves. Human creatures, angelic creatures, we are all slaves of God. I'm a fellow slave of you and of your brothers, the prophets. So the prophets were human slaves. You apostles are human slaves. Human creatures are slaves. Angelic creatures, we're all slaves of God. And we all have to observe the words of the scroll, worship God. So let me ask the question. If you're an angelic creature in heaven, are you already a slave by nature? Do you already exist in the form of a slave? If you're an angelic creature in heaven. Daniel 7 verse 10. Daniel 7 verse 10. Go watch it. Watch where I'm going to go with this. Daniel 7, verse 10. A stream of fire was flowing and going out from before him. A thousand thousands kept ministering to him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court took its seat and books were open. So the myriads of angelic creatures are standing in attention, ready to serve and minister. Okay. Psalm 103, 20 to 21. Psalm 103, 20 to 21. Watch here. Praise Jehovah, all you his angels, mighty in power, who carry out his word, obeying his voice. So you carry his word, you obey his voice, you do his commands. Praise Jehovah, all his armies, his ministers who do his will. So angelic creatures, spirit creatures in heaven, are servants, ministers who serve and slave and obey. <clears throat> okay? Everyone got it? So what about humans? Well, yeah, we just read. We just read where the angel says, John, look, John, like you and the prophets, your brothers, like humans, I am a slave because we're all creatures created to serve, slave, and obey God. So let me ask the question. If you're an angelic creature and if you're a human being, do you not already exist in the form of a slave? Are you not already a slave in position, status, and form? And by the way, form of a slave, let me explain what that word means. Your form, the form that you have, will signify your status, and your position. Meaning, I'm in the form of a human. I look human. By my form, by my appearance, you know automatically I'm a servant. Why? Because human creatures are servants by nature. 
Angelic creatures are servants by nature. So when you see someone that has the form, the appearance of a human, you know that's a slave. When you see someone that has a form and appearance of an angel, you know that's a slave. So form of a slave means having the appearance of a slave, meaning that which by its very appearance, <clears throat> you recognize that he or she is a slave of God. So form, morphe means the appearance by which others are able to know and realize and tell whether he or she is a slave. So to be in the form of a slave means you have the appearance by which others realize, oh, that's a servant. So to have human appearance, to be human by nature means you're a servant. To be an angelic creature, to have the appearance of an angel means you're a servant. Right? Okay. Now watch how their Bible is going to bury them. Philippians 2 verses 6 to 7. Watch here. Am I clear, guys? Am I making sense? I'm not confusing you because I can't stand my voice. As long as it's pleasing to you and Spirit is using my, my voice to help you understand, all glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. Watch here. Who, although, now notice, this is before Christ was born as a man. Who, although he was existing in God's form, gave no consideration to a seizure. He didn't consider to seize onto something. He didn't consider to seize that he should be equal to God. So what did he do? No, but he emptied himself and took a slave's form and became human. Now notice what it said. Jesus took on the form of a slave when he was born as a human being. Why? Because to be human is to be a slave. So when Jesus became human, took on a human nature and a physical body, that appearance, that human appearance, signified he is now a slave. Let me repeat again. I hope I'm not tiring you guys that I repeat myself. Morphe, the word morphe in Greek, form means the shape or appearance by which you identify the nature or status or position of a thing. Okay? So when I see Linda and she has the form of a human, she has human shape. That means she's a slave because human creatures are created to slave for God. So by her form, by her appearance, I can know her status and position. So if I see an angelic creature, by that appearance, by that shape, by that form, I know that is a servant. So to be in a form of a slave means you have the appearance by which others who see your appearance know that you're a slave. Right? So how do we know that Jesus took on the form of a slave? How do we know that he had become a slave? How do we know? What did he do that now signified he had assumed the form of a slave? Help me out, guys. What did Jesus do that now signified to those who saw him he now had taken the form of a slave, had become a slave? Uh, I'm asking to so make sure you're getting the question. You understand the exegesis. Linda got it. No, I'm sorry, not Linda. Jeremy got it. Kiri got it. Alpha got it. Catholic got it. Linda got it. Sarah, did you get it? Food got it. What about you, Sarah? How do we know that Jesus had now become a slave? What did he do that signified he had now become a slave? Because it says he took the form of a slave. Darwin got it? Sarah, what's the answer, Sarah? I want to make sure you got it. What did Jesus do which signified that he had now become a slave? Pedro, you got it? Okay. Who else? Come on, Sarah. You're silent. Don't be scared. I got to make sure you're getting it. Philippians 2, 7. 
He took on the form of a slave and became human. Angry got it. Persona, you got it. Sarah, did you get it? Okay. Okay, now we got a problem. If Jesus only became a slave when he became human, he became a slave, took on the form of a slave and the status of a slave and the nature of a slave when he became human. That means before he became human, he wasn't a slave. But wait, in heaven, if he wasn't a slave, that means he cannot be an angelic creature. Because if Jesus was an angelic creature, angels who are created are already in the form of a slave because being created angels, they are created to serve by their very nature. That means Jesus wasn't a slave in heaven because he only became a slave, only took on the form of a slave, only took on the status of a slave when he became human and took on human nature because to be human is to be a slave, which means in heaven he was no creature. He wasn't a slave. What was he? God, because he was in the form of God. To be in the form of God is to be God. To be in the form of a slave it is, is to be a slave. Uh-oh, Jehovah Witness. He couldn't be an angelic creature, Alpha, because he was the angel of the Lord, but that angel of the Lord wasn't a creature. He was the messenger of the Father who took the status of a messenger, even though by nature he is God and equal to the Father. Make a distinction between angels who are <clears throat> created to be messengers and servants, angelic creatures, and from the Logos, the Son, who took the status of a messenger, even though by nature he was no messenger, he is God. You got it? Linda, I'm about to headbutt you spiritually. I can't explain because I don't know what you're not getting. So can you call me on Skype so I can help you? If Jesus only became a slave, took on the form of a slave when he became human because to be human is to be a slave by nature and to be an angelic creature is to be a slave by nature. But Jesus wasn't a slave until he came to the earth and was born of the virgin and took on human nature. That means before he was born as a man, while in heaven, he did not exist as a slave. Well, if he didn't exist as a slave in heaven, then he could not be an angelic creature because angels who are created are already slaves. So what was he? God. That's why it says he was in the form of God and took the form of a slave. Therefore, to be in the form of God means you're God and not a creature. Just like to be in the form of a slave means that you are a servant created to serve and therefore not God. But with Jesus, it's different. He's in the form of God and therefore not a creature who took on the nature of a man, a human nature that he created with the Father and Spirit and became flesh and united to his person, a physical body and a human nature and a human mind without ceasing to be God. And it was only then when he entered creation and took on the nature of a man that he created and united to his person, that he became a slave. So that means in heaven, he was no creature. That means in heaven, he wasn't a slave. What well, was he? The divine son of God equal to the father. You got it now? Yeah. Creatures by their very nature are slaves but slaves can have different forms an angelic creature is also in the form of a slave but <clears throat> slaves come in different shapes and sizes some slaves have the form of angelic creatures other slaves have the form of human beings other slaves have the form of animals but a creature no matter what form or shape 
if it's created by its very nature, it is created to serve. So not all slaves have the same form, but if you're a creature, you are in the form of a slave because to be a slave means you're a creature created to serve. And there are different creatures created with different forms, different shapes, but what they have in common, if they're a creature, no matter what the form, they are slaves. You got it now? Everyone got it? You can't get around it. I gave you Bible, Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Okay? Daniel 7, 10. Psalm 103, 20, 21. Angelic creatures, ministers, slaves created to serve and minister. Human creatures, slaves of God. So then if Jesus is a creature in heaven, he's already in the form of a slave. But Philippians 2, 6 says, no, he wasn't. He was in the form of God and then only took the form of a slave when he became human and was born as a man and appeared in human likeness. See how that backfired? They thought Philippians 2.9 refuted us and Acts 5.31 refuted us, but now we showed, if you read in the context, it buries them and shows that Jesus is not the Father, but he is the eternal divine Son, equal to the Father in essence, nature, power, glory, and ability, who then took on the nature of a man, condescended to be born as a human male, be conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, and taking on an additional nature of humanity, and in that status, humbled himself to be a slave, and then God honored him by exalting him to a superior position, to the position he had on earth. That's what Trinitarians have always believed. You got it? Making sense? From a lot? Okay, now let's now further bury this objection and go to some other points. Let's go to Psalm 148, 13 in Jehovah's Witness Bible. Uh, 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 let me answer. Darwin, false dichotomy. Who told you it's either or? You are a servant who's a son and a daughter because faithful children serve their parents. It's rebellious children who refuse to honor their parents by serving them. You're both. Where's the problem? Psalm 148, 13. Let them praise the name of Jehovah for his name alone is unreachably high. Is there any other name? That is unreachably high? No. His majesty is above earth and heaven. So whose name alone is unreachably high? The name of Jehovah. The being of Jehovah. The status of Jehovah. Right? The authority of Jehovah. Who else reigns as high as Jehovah? Is there anyone who reigns as high as him? Psalm 113 verse 5. Psalm 113 verse 5. Psalm 113, verse 5. Who is like Jehovah, our God, the one who dwells on high? This is a rhetorical question. The answer is no one. Is there anyone who dwells on high like Jehovah? Is there anyone who reigns from the highest position like Jehovah? And is there any name that's unreachable high besides Jehovah's name? What's the answer? What's the answer? Is there anyone who reigns on high like Jehovah? Is there any name that's unreasonably high alongside of Jehovah's? Come on, guys. Help me answer this so we can really bury them. No, Protestant, there isn't. If you say there is, you're a heretic, and I'm really going to have to block you. No, there isn't. 
There is no one who is as high as Jehovah and name equal to Jehovah because Jesus is Jehovah. Stupid answer, buddy. Come on, bro. You're dropping the ball today. I'm going to have to send you packing, sir. All right? Everyone got it? Is there anyone who dwells as high as Jehovah does? No. Is there any name unreachable high as Jehovah's? No, right? Right? All right. Now let's reread Philippians 2 verse 9. Now I'm going to show you their interlinear where the word other is not in the Greek. They're so dishonest, they added the word other in their translation, whereas if you go to their interlinear, there is no other. For this very reason, God exalted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every name. Now notice they added the word other. Just to prove to you the word other is not there, here you go, their own interlinear from JW.org. You go to JW.org, their main page, scroll down to the bottom, and you're going to find at the bottom a link to this. It says online Bible. Go to near the end, online Bible. When you click on it, they make available their Bibles online for free. Here it is. There's the link. AW.org backslash EN backslash library backslash B-I-B-L-E. Okay. You'll find on JW.org. There you're going to find their Greek interlinear, which they use. Here it is. The kingdom interlinear translation of the Greek scriptures. Here it is, guys. Save these resources. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ for all these online resources that are free. We only pray for the internet. There it is. Then you go to Philippians, right? Watch here. Chapter 2. Let me get you the link. This is why StreamYard has an advantage because I can show it to you on screen. Maybe next time, Lord willing. Here's the link to Philippians 2.9, their own Greek and their English translation. There it is, guys. Please, Sarah, everyone, click on it. Click on it, guys. Is the word other in the Greek that they use? Is the word other in the Greek that they use? No. Here it is. Dio ke otheos auton huper hupsosin ke echarisatu auto tu anoma tu huper pan anoma or onoma. The over every name through which also the God him put high up over and he graciously gave to him the name the over every name, pan, every, onoma, all names, not other. There's no word other there. You guys see it? Why do you think they added the word other in their translation? Because now, guys, let me ask you a question. If Jehovah alone reigns on high and Jehovah alone Jehovah alone has a name. Jehovah's name alone is unreachably high. What does it tell you about Jesus who went from the position of a slave to be exalted by the Father to the highest position where he now possesses the name above every name in existence? What does that tell you about Jesus? Who is Jesus then for the Father to honor him that way? What does that tell you about Jesus? If Jehovah's name alone, Jehovah alone has a name that's unreachably high, and Jehovah alone dwells on high, but then the Father, in his love and appreciation for what the Son did, exalts the Son from the lowest position imaginable, a slave, and exalts him to the highest position in existence. And now he possesses the name that is unreachably high, the highest name. That means the Father is acknowledging and honoring the Son as his equal in nature, in essence, in glory, power, status, and position. But that's something that would be idolatrous for the Father to do if Jesus is a creature. Right? And hence they add the word other to deceive you. But wait. 
They dropped the ball in Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, because there they translate it accurately. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23 in their Bible. You caught it now? See how easy it is to decimate these Bible perverts when you know the truth and have the truth and walk in the truth and love the truth and yield to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Now watch their translation, guys. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. When Jesus humbled himself to die, what did the Father do? And how surpassing the greatness of his power is toward us believers. God's power is infinite beyond comprehension, and he exercises his power for our benefit, not for our harm. He uses that power in love for us, out of his love for us. A power that guarantees that he'll preserve us incorruptible. A power that he used and displayed and showed in raising Jesus immortal. Read. It is according to the operation of the mightiness of his strength, which he exercised toward Christ when he raised him up from the dead. Imagine what power you must have to raise someone and make him immortal. And seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now notice the status of Jesus, guys. This is their Bible. Jesus now, when he ascended to reign at the right hand of the Father is now far above every, not some, not most, every government. Jesus is above every government and authority and power and lordship. And he's above every name that is named. Wow. Not only in this system of things, but also in the one to come, in new heavens and earth, Jesus will be far above, superior to every name, every power, every authority. He also subjected all things under his feet. Jesus has every created thing under his feet and made him. Jesus is now head, the head of his body, the church, and he's head over all things. He's supreme over all creation for the benefit of his congregation, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills up all things and all. How can Jesus be exalted above every name, every power, every authority, every government in this age, age to come and be supreme as the head of all created things for the benefit of his church's body, assuring us that there is no power that can destroy us because he is the head who's supreme over all creation and will preserve us if Jesus is a creature. Can you explain that to me, guys? Can you explain that to me? Both Ramiel, my brother in law, and Kiri Leison asked the same question. <laughs> so, how do they tap dance around Ephesians 1? This ruins them. And notice Ramiel. Both of you guys, look, same question. How do JWs refute these passages if it contradicts? They hope you're ignorant of the Bible. What they're hoping is they don't meet someone like you. Because they do, they'll never discuss with you ever again. They'll never talk. I'm not lying. Once they know you know your Bible, they'll avoid you like the plague. Okay? You see how it backfired against them? Acts 5.31, backfired against them. Philippians 2.9, backfired against them. But it's going to get much worse. Much worse, guys. I'm not even done with Philippians yet. Now let's look at Isaiah 45.23. Isaiah 45, 23. Watch here. Isaiah 45, 23. God speaking, Jehovah speaking, and he has sworn. Look what Jehovah has sworn. By myself, I have sworn the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. And it will not return. See, I have sworn my word will not fail to do what I said. And what will happen and must happen? The day will come when to me, every knee will bend. Every knee will worship me and every tongue will swear loyalty to me. You guys caught it there? God has sworn and the day will come voluntarily or involuntarily where every knee will bow to Jehovah and acknowledge of who Jehovah is and swear to him. 
When will that happen? According to the New Testament. Let's go to Romans 14, 9 to 12. Paul tells us when this is going to happen. Romans 14, verses 9 to 12. Watch here, guys. Romans 14, verses 9 to 12. Watch here. For to this end Christ died and came to life again, so that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. Now, this is the Jehovah's Witness Bible that Protestants quoting. Now, watch here, guys. When will this be fulfilled? Paul tells you. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you also look down on your brother? For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. At the last day, the day of judgment, Isaiah 45, 23 will be fulfilled. Because notice what he quotes. For it is written, as surely as I live, says Jehovah, to me every knee will bend and every tongue will make open acknowledgement to God. So then each of us will render an account for himself to God. So when will Isaiah 45, 23 be fulfilled? On the day of judgment. Every creature, Muhammad, that filthy dog, that scum bastard is burning in hell. Every creature, Satan himself, on the day of judgment, will fulfill Isaiah 45, 23. Everyone will have to bow in submission and acknowledge Jehovah's God. Those who didn't, don't do it now will be forced to do it then as a sign that God has now humiliated them, subjugated them, and he will now destroy them with everlasting destruction. But we who do it now, when we do it on that day, will be done out of love and acknowledgement as we are then rewarded to dwell with Christ forever. So when will Isaiah 45, 23 be fulfilled? At the last day, the day of judgment, where every creature stands before the judgment seat of God, right? Right? Okay. Now I want you to catch something. I want you to do me something a favor, Protestant believer. Post Romans 14, verse 10, back to back with 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11. Now, don't post yet. Get them ready. Romans 14, verse 10. Back to back with 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 to 11. It's a Jehovah's Witness Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 to 11. And Philippians 2, 10 to 11. So let me repeat. Romans 14, 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11. And Philippians 2, 10 to 11. Watch here, guys. Watch what happens. Get ready to be blown away. Watch here. From the Joe Witness Bible. Watch here. Yep, he is. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you also look down on your brother? For you will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So it's God's judgment seat. seat we will stand and give an account. But hold on. The same Paul, same apostle inspired by the Spirit, wrote 2 Corinthians. Now help me understand this. I'm confused. Romans 14 says we stand before the judgment seat of God. But in 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11, as Holy Spirit takes over my tongue, 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Christ. Wait, we're going to stand before whose judgment seat? God or the Christ? Both and. The judgment seat of God is the judgment seat of the Christ because Christ is the one that will judge so that each one may be repaid according to the things he has practiced while in the body, whether good or bad. Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, he didn't quote verse 11, you see? We keep persuading men, but we are well known to God. However, I hope that we are all well known also to your consciences. So I'm waiting for Philippians 2.11 before the rapture. So it's the judgment seat of Christ which is the judgment seat of God that we're going to stand before and give an account as Christ, who is God, judges us. Now notice, on that day, every knee will bow to who? Philippians 2, 10 to 11. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the ground, and every tongue should openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh-oh. Wait, 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 wait. Isaiah 45, 23, where God swears, every knee will bow to me and swear loyalty to me. 
will be fulfilled on the day of judgment where every creature, both the righteous and the wicked, will bow and swear to Jesus because it's his judgment seat that we will appear before because he'll be sitting on the judgment seat on the day of judgment where we will have to give an answer to him. And on that day, everyone will bow to Jesus and swear to Jesus and confess Jesus is Lord, which will glorify the Father because the Father wants everyone to acknowledge Jesus is Lord because that delights his heart and he's glorified when his son is glorified. And this is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Whose judgment seat? God. Whose judgment seat? The Christ. Whose judgment seat? The Christ who is God. Every knee will bow to who? Jehovah. When? On that day. The day of judgment. Every knee will bow to who? Jesus. When? On that day. The day of judgment. Every tongue will swear to who? Jesus. On that day, confessing him as Lord. But Isaiah said, every tongue will swear to Jehovah. How does that work? Because Jesus is the Jehovah God, whom every knee will bow to and every tongue swear. On that day, where he sits on his judgment seat and every creature will have to give an answer to him. John 5, 22 to 23. That is Jehovah's Bible. John 5, 22 to 23. And this glorifies God. God is glorified, honored, and elated when every creature bows to his son and acknowledges his son as Jehovah because that's what the Father wants all creatures to do. How do I know? Here it is. John 5, 22 to 23. Here it is. Jesus himself. John 5, 22 to 23. In the Jehovah Witness Bible. For the Father judges no one at all. Well, if the Father doesn't judge anyone, then who's coming on that day sitting on a judgment seat to judge? But he has entrusted all the judging to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Could it be any clearer? Jesus is that Jehovah God who comes to judge all creation, who will come to sit on his judgment seat, and all creatures will stand before him to answer to him as he judges them. And it is to him every knee in creation will bow and confess as Jehovah. Mari ikut Yesus. Mari ke jalan yang benar. Tuhan berkati.